Good morning. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. Um, hi, Jonathan. Uh, congratulations on The Escape Artist. It's, it's an extraordinary book. It's a, it's a tough book to read. As you say, at Auschwitz, humanity had uh, created uh, its perennial fantasies of hell. It had produced hell on Earth. Uh, why did you choose to take us back there today through the personality of Walter Rosenberg, uh, this 18-year-old Slovak Jew who found himself at Auschwitz and proceeded over the ensuing two years to become a kind of encyclopedia of the camp? Thank, thank you, Roger. Um, and thanks to all of you for being here to hear about this man. As you just heard there, he's, he was born Walter Rosenberg, Walter Rosenberg, later would become Rudolf Werber. That's part of his story as well, how the name changed. Um, the why now question is especially strong because I'd known this story a long time. Uh, I came across this story when I was 19 years old uh, when I had seen, sitting in a you know, darkened room, a London cinema in 1986, which means I'm nearly 57, to save you doing the maths. Because <laughs> otherwise you were going to be working. And I'm 68. <laughs> so age 19, I was sitting in a cinema watching this really unusual film, um, a nine and a half hour documentary film. It was broken up into two halves uh, called Shoah by the French filmmaker Claude Landsman. And it's an, it, the pro film is very unusual. It consists only of... Uh, interviews, there's no archive pictures, just interviews with people who were witness to or survived the attempt to murder all the Jews in the world. And uh, the, as I saw at age 19, all these people in the film were these old, very grey men. That's how it looked to me, age 19, until one man sort of er erupts on the screen, this explosion of movie star charisma, uh, this man, Rudolf Werber, who speaks English and is physically younger looking. He's in New York City, very different from everyone else. And almost in passing, the film mentions that this man, this Jew, had escaped from Auschwitz. And even though I was just 19, I knew enough to know that that was extremely unusual, that Jews basically did not escape from Auschwitz. There's some argument about the numbers, but it's, it's you know, minimum four, maximum eight or nine, depending on how you count. It's very, very few. Uh, and so I was intrigued by this man, and I remembered the story for many, many years to come. Then... Well, you remembered it for three decades before you did anything, anything with it. Anything about it. I mean, three and a half decades. As a, on, so on this a, was a, a long gestation? It was. I mean, I'm just thinking journalistically, it's embarrassing to hold on to a story <laughs> that long. But it, and it, how it, present was it inside you in that, during that period? I never forgot about it. I mean, yeah. I always was aware of his name. I would pick up bits and pieces here and there, thinking that this is something to come back to. The point is that why now, in, in 2016, especially in... Uh, in Britain, maybe also in the United States, we were suddenly in the era of post-truth. And people were talking about post-truth. And I was writing about it. And I could tell that on some level it wasn't really getting through to readers. Uh, and I was thinking th th that there was had been an example where the difference between truth and lies was the difference between life and death. And that's what took me back to the Rudolf Erber story. And then the strange thing is by the time I was actually then working on the book, we were in the global pandemic of COVID. And then the difference between truth and lies and life and death was suddenly very dramatic because you had an American president saying, you know, inject yourself with bleach to cure yourself of COVID. And that was obviously not true. And it was a matter of life and death, what was true and what was not true. So the story was suddenly very resonant. There's a kind of uh, relentless detailing of every atrocity uh, within the camps. You don't spare the reader in any way. And most of us are familiar with Auschwitz at some level. Was this a conscious decision to put the reader there through the sheer volume of detail and the portrayal of a place where there was simply no limit 
no limit whatsoever to the kinds of horror that could be perpetrated. Yes, it was a conscious decision, but I was led to it by Verbe himself, because he, I mentioned that he had escaped from Auschwitz, that much I knew, and he'd escaped when he was 19, but he'd been in there since he was, incredibly enough, since he was 17. He was there for nearly two years, 22 months. Um, it's extremely unusual. The life expectancy of a Jew in Auschwitz was measured in hours, usually, for most. For some who were not sent immediately to the gas chambers, but were instead uh, selected for work, slave labor, their life expectancy might be weeks or months. He was there for two years, and, and he was assigned as a slave to many, many different parts of the camp, and it meant he had a, a 360 degree view of the camp. He had seen he all was, of the He horrors. was on the ramp for 10 months. He, that's Perhaps the, tell, yes. tell our audience about the ramp. Um, I will, and so, uh, I mean, the point about it was he saw the whole process, including we'll, we'll get the, this point about the ramp. He was uh, bounced around different places. He saw it all, which is why he was able, in his own testimony afterwards, to describe all the different horrors that you mentioned. But the crucial one, in a way, was the ramp. And he was there for 10 months. What is the ramp? It's the, in German, they called it the Alte Judenrampe, the old Jew ramp. This was the railway platform where the trains that were arriving in, uh, into Auschwitz would, would pull in, bringing in Jews from all over Europe. So there, would be a, there could be up to five trains a day. Often they would actually arrive at night. And they would be from Holland, Belgium, France, Germany, Greece, uh, Italy. They would be from all points across Europe. And what he w his job was there to immediately take off the train, the people, but also, crucially, their possessions. Part, you know, the people would come with suitcases, uh, with bundles of blankets, pots and pans, and so on. He realized a, a crucial thing working there as a slave, which was that every single person he witnessed arriving had no idea of where they had come. Not one had any clue of the purpose of this place. Uh, they had been deceived. At every step of the way, they had been told they were resettling uh, elsewhere in the East to start new lives. And so they brought with them the stuff for new lives. They brought... Um, clothes and, and pots and pans for cooking. They'd brought children's toys for their kids. They'd brought exercise books for their children to learn. They thought they were starting a new life. And the reason for that, was the reason why that was so important, uh, young Volta, who later would become Rudy, what he realized was this was why they were complying with the orders they were given. When they were told to get off the train, they would get off the train. When they were told to line up in columns, they would line up in columns and in rows of five. And he understood, young as he was, he was just a teenager, he was 18. He had this tremendous insight, which was that this was a crucial part of the Nazi killing method. It wasn't an added extra. It was essential to make the thing work smoothly. He would say later, it is much easier to kill sheep than to hunt Deer. And what he meant by that was, if the Nazis could make the Jews come off these trains and line up is like sheep going to the abattoir, that would be much easier for them to organize than if they started running in and there was chaos and a stampede and people were panicked. Then they would be running into the, away from the camp and it would be like shooting deer or hunting deer on the hillside. So truth, truth, in fact, would have been fatal to the whole operation. It depended entirely on deception. And in fact, there were a lot of guards, but there were thousands and thousands and thousands of Jews being brought to this abattoir for the slaughter, who presumably, if they'd known the truth, could have overwhelmed the guards. If their thought had ever crossed their mind, they yeah. could have at the very least. He actually would say he didn't have inter, uh, indulged fantasies of them staging some huge yeah. revolt with, of, of overwhelming. But what he thought, if they had knowledge, if they had truth, at the very least, they might be able to cause panic. 
And panic would be very bad for the Nazis for exactly the reason you've said, which is they would have been outnumbered. There would have been a stampede. There would have been one running that way, one running the other way. That would have been very difficult to control and people would have got away. And it was because the Nazis so feared the truth getting out that they went to extreme lengths. Right down to the final shower, yes. which in fact was a shower of uh, cyanide pellets. They were, they were going to the so-called shower, the showers which they thought were going to be the, where they would be deloused, disinfected. Instead, they would be gassed. And then right. take up their professions. And, oh, I mean, the, the, the deception was so elaborate, they were told as they were going towards the gas chambers, remember, you must tell us what trade do you work in. Ah, you're a shoemaker. That's very useful. We need to know that. Um, as they were undressing, they were told... Remember, keep your shoes together, left and right, because it will be very hard to find the pair later. They were always told about later, um, as if when in truth, of course, there would be no later. Uh, they would start in, there are cases of them being handed uh, a towel or a bar of soap uh, to maintain the illusion uh, <coughs> that they were going to live. The deception went all the way up to the gas chamber, even in... In crematorium two, the gas chambers there were fitted with fake shower heads so that the illusion would be maintained till the last second because if it had broken the illusion, if the truth had dawned, then there could have been panic even inside the gas chamber and that could, would have slowed things down. The Nazis were running a very efficient sort of factory of death and they needed it to be an assembly line that worked extremely smoothly. It was seeing that that led Rudolf Werber, young as he was, age 18, to realize the only way to slow down this Nazi killing machine was if to tear down this veil of ignorance. If the Jews of Europe knew the fate that awaited them at Auschwitz, then they wouldn't go in the same way. They wouldn't comply. And therefore, the, the key, he thought, was somebody has to tell them. And with the wonderful arrogance of teenage youth, he thought that somebody might as well be me. And not only the Jews of Europe, presumably, presumably, if others had known uh, in Washington and elsewhere, they might have tried to do something about it more expeditiously. Let me just read you a very brief passage. Um, and this illustrates the kind of detail in the book that can be overwhelming, but is extremely important in my view. Before a body was flung out of the door, we're in the mortuary here, before a body was flung out of the door and onto the back of the truck, one man would lift its arm and read off the number from the tattoo. As you know, every, uh, every Jew in Auschwitz, every prisoner in Auschwitz, who didn't go immediately to the slaughter, was tattooed with a number that was then born for the rest of that person's life. And read off the number from the tattoo. As registrar, Wetzler would note it down. Wetzler was uh, the man who escaped uh, with Walter Rosenberg, later Rudi Verber. A second man would then prize open the mouth of the deceased, looking for gold teeth. If he saw one, he would yank it out with a pair of pliers, then toss the gold into a tin can. So from all this, Jonathan, what do we learn about human nature? Well, I mean, the business of contemplating this subject is to come face to face with the very, very worst that human beings are capable of. And, I, I, you know, it is very easy to come away with a tremendously bleak conclusion about humanity because of the degree of brutality that we're all capable of uh, once there's a system which endorses it. And, and that's the thing about Auschwitz, was a whole world was created. You know, there were survivors of Auschwitz who came away afterwards. By the say, German people. Well, so, yeah, I mean, by the Nazis, by the German people is a very, low, you know, it, that's an interesting judgment, but it was, it was uh, an entire world was created there. And there was one survivor who famously said that, look, you wouldn't understand it, it was another planet, it was planet Auschwitz. I mean, the depressing truth, it was not another planet, it was here, on this planet, but it did create a sort of different moral universe where black was white, good was evil, night was day, and, for, and these people lived in this universe for 
years. But if evil behavior is endorsed by a system, people will perform evil acts. And that's what I think comes away from it. It isn't really about the individual whim of this person or that person. It's the overall framework. Within that, there are people who are capable of extraordinary acts of, of kindness, but also of heroism. And I think this one by these, he was a teenager, but Fred Wetzler, who you mentioned, who is his friend, this resolution to tell the world against extraordinary odds is an example of it. I mean, what we will come on to how you know the escape in a moment, but he knew Rudolf Rudy. He knew and understood that even then, as a teenager, it was no good just coming out and then saying to people, look, terrible things are going on there. He understood that you absolutely had to have chapter and verse detail. And therefore, he set about this extraordinary feat of memorizing what he was He was witnessing. a mathematician. He would go on to... He was, a math, he was a math sort of prodigy. He would go on to be a scientist. He had... He was gifted with an extraordinary memory. And uh, I did toy with calling this book, instead of the escape artist, the memory man, because he was like somebody at one of those sort of Victorian, you know, freak shows who could just perform uh, amazing acts of escapology, <coughs> but also of memory. He memorized every transport he witnessed. And by that, I mean every train that arrived, he would work out an average of number of people per carriage of the train, number of carriages, point of origin, and then this, which is to me the most extraordinary bit, the, the kind of serial number of those who were taken off the train to be used as slaves, and that being the number that Rogers just talked about, the tattoo, there would be a series of numbers from you know, 87,520 to 87,941 would correspond with a specific transport on a specific date from a specific place. And he memorized around 300 of those in, in meticulous detail. And was, those data, uh, details were later checked, and he remembered every single one accurately. Yes, you recount in the book how he's, I think he's in New York, and he sees a tattoo on somebody's arm in a restaurant, and he says, oh yes, uh, you must have been from Poland or, or wherever it was. But he's still, even much later well, that in life, story, remember, yeah. I mean, that story is what con convinced me that the claims about his memory were right. He was in a New York restaurant, exactly as you say, in the 1970s, a very hot day. The waiter came to the table with his sleeves of his shirt rolled up, and Rudy saw the tattoo on the man's arm and said, Grodno. 15th of May, 1943. And the waiter looked at him and said, how did you know? Yeah, well, uh, he had remembered you, exactly tell us, the you tell us in this remarkable book how he knew. I was reminded reading the passages about um, the Jews packed into these uh, cattle cars, taking them to, to Auschwitz. They have no idea, uh, obviously, where they're going. And they are literally, after three or four days, dying of thirst. And whenever the train stops, they can see through the cracks in the wood, uh, SS officers or others just drinking as much water uh, as, as they could. And the children, in particular, are going crazy. <clears throat> and this reminded me of Primo Levi, uh, whose great book, If This Is a Man, I'm sure you know, and the scene when he first arrives in Auschwitz, and, just, and he's dying of thirst, and just outside his window, there's an icicle, and he reaches for the icicle, and a guard comes and just slaps his arm down so he cannot reach the icicle. And he says, warum? Why? Why? And the guard says, here is kein warum. Here there is no why. And you take us into a world where there is indeed no why. And, and you know, that's interesting too. That I think the, compar the, the reference to Vit Levy is right and the, just the point about the cattle car and thirst, how thirst drives, can drive a person insane, Literally extreme insane, thirst. Yeah. Um, I think that what's interesting about that observation about there is no why is Verba himself later wouldn't really f uh, obsess about those questions. Partly because he was a scientist, he would talk about the facts of what had happened. As was Levy. Yeah, yes, both scientists. Um, 
And, um, and Rudy wasn't quite as accomplished a scientist later in life, partly because of what had happened to him. Um, the, it was it, the, the business of just enabling people to know what's happened, the what, uh, rather than why, was his preoccupation. He was determined that people should just know these facts. And having memorized all this detail, he and Wetzler together, in uh, the spring of 1944, we are approaching the 80th anniversary. It was in April 1944. Um, they finally were able to mount their escape. Um, I'm not going to tell you how they did it, um, and that's partly because I want you all to read the book. Um, you actually tell us twice in the book. <laughs> yeah, um, of how they did it. It's like a, it's, it's a, it, was an well, they, it was an ingenious uh, method that they devised. It required amazing physical bravery, but also uh, tremendous sort of ingenuity. Uh, again, the, 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 this young teenage mind together with his fellow uh, escape companion, Fred Wetzler, they spotted a, a, a no, you loophole. You mustn't tell it, Jonathan. I'm not going to. I'm going to just say they spotted really a, a gap in the Nazi defenses. Um, and it wasn't a physical gap. There was no hole in a fence. It was a loophole, really. And they were able to exploit that and get out. And they did get out. Uh, we don't have time to tell you that, the, you know, then is really in some ways where their troubles began. I mean, it was hard enough escaping Auschwitz, incredibly hard. Hardly anyone ever did it. They were among the very first. Once they'd done it, they then had to get their way through Nazi-occupied Poland. Uh, and as, as Rudy would later say, you know, we emerged from Auschwitz with no map, no compass, no friends. There was no resistance network on the outside of Jews helping them, uh, as there were actually in the case of some Soviet prisoners of war who escaped or Polish political prisoners. They instead had to go through uh, occupied Poland, uh, crossing mountains and rivers and marshes and forests, always on the lookout for any uh, SS men or collaborators or, uh, or German, ethnic German settlers in Poland. There were lots of them. They had to avoid all of that. They would move only at night. Um, they couldn't risk moving by day. They would have to uh, forage for food. They were given advice that if they were offered money, they mustn't take it. Because if you have money, then you will be tempted to spend it. And if you spend it, that's when you will reveal yourself. So they had, there were all kinds of pitfalls but somehow, amazingly, they made it to Slovakia, which was their home country, across the border, and there they would finally tell their story. Yes, they compiled this 32-page uh, single-spaced report. But, and of course, some word had gotten out by other means, other escapees, other sources. But this, I think, was the most detailed report, along with maps of the camp, uh, uh, every single gas chamber crematoria. And yet, even then, uh, in 1944, the response is dilatory, it's lukewarm. Some people say, yeah, well, this is just the Jewish point of view. Uh, there is a reluctance to believe this. Um, and of course, the human imagination does falter in trying to comprehend this degree of evil. Um, again, what does this tell us? Why, why did the world essentially just look on? Even when they had this report, all the evidence. Yeah. I mean, that why question is so difficult because it ran completely counter to the assumption Rudy had. When he was in the camp, his assumption was, obviously, the world does not know about this place. Otherwise, they wouldn't be allowing this to happen. And therefore, we have got to get the word out. And almost just by getting the word out, out of course, there will be action. And so they do the hard bit. They are escaping. They make contact with the tiny remnant Jewish community in Slovakia. They, as you say, they sort of dictate this report. It gets out. By the way, getting out. Getting the word out is not an easy thing. You know, now we imagine that information crosses the world at the press of a button, you know, with an email or whatever. Then people had to hand copy this report and smuggle it out hand by hand, person to person, with, you know, resistance fighter to diplomat to uh, priest across borders until it does eventually 
as we heard before, reach you know, Roosevelt in Washington, Churchill in London, the Pope in Rome. And, and Rudy's fantasy really was that once they had it, they would uh, immediately act on it. Um, and instead, it did run into this problem. And I quote in the book an example of a different kind of whistleblower, actually a different messenger, uh, a man called Jan Karski, who didn't know about Auschwitz, very importantly, did hardly any details about Auschwitz. But he knew that the Germans were killing Jews, and he went to Washington um, uh, earlier on and met a, a Jewish judge on the Supreme Court, Felix Frankfurter, and told him the detail. And Frankfurter said... I don't believe you. And the man who had brought Frankfurter, uh, but brought Karski to him said, well, you must believe him. He comes with the highest possible recommendations. And he says, no, no, you misunderstand me. I didn't say he was not telling the truth. I said, I don't believe him. And these are different things. I cannot believe him. And that, to me, is the resonant thing for now. We sometimes know the truth. We know the facts. The example I would give for ex is climate, the, what is happening with the climate. We know the facts, but something in us stops us being able to believe them. And this, I think, is a very human weakness. Uh, it's universal. I don't think it was just uh, true of then or just true about the Holocaust. I think there are some facts which are sometimes just too difficult for us to absorb. Now, in this case, as, Ro as you said, Roger, I mean, there was also prejudice. There was, you know, I found these documents uh, in the British Foreign Office when it said uh, we have to allow for a degree of Jewish exaggeration. Uh, there were uh, people in the United States who were similarly expressing anti-Jewish, anti-Semitic attitudes, and that made them disbelieve. So the combination you of... you say that anti-Semitism was rampant? Then? Yes. yes, I would. I mean, it was um, absolutely just part of... Uh, the culture, I mean, the reason, by the way, partly... Whose culture? Well, uh, that's a good question, too. I mean, I think in, it, was a, it was alive in European culture, obviously, um, and, and that's why so many people were willing to go along with the murder of Jews. But I would say in the Anglo-American culture, you know, in Britain and America, to sp to, for people did not hesitate to write down in a memo, you know, we have done quite enough for these wailing Jews, which was written in a Foreign Office memo, uh, you look at the wailing of, Jews. That was that phrase used by a foreign office official, even in the light of what he knew was being written down in front of him, which was the murder of millions of Jews. But you look at the literature of the time, you know, whether it's T.S. Eliot and the Wasteland or a book that, you know, I enjoyed as a sort of young boy, John Buck and the 39 Steps, you know, the Jews were just the routine villain and so on. So I think it was around, it was there. And that also enabled people to hear the facts that Rudy and Fred had got out and not act on them. And this, it's worth remembering, is no more than a lifetime ago or maybe less than a contemporary lifetime. And we're talking about events of 80 years ago, 8-0. Uh, we're not talking about events of 400 years ago. Jonathan, how do you think the experience of having gone, as we've discussed, as lambs to the slaughter, to the tune of six million human beings, how do you think that affected, has affected and affects the Jewish psyche and by extension the Israeli psyche? Well, it definitely does. And um, I think you cannot uh, even begin to understand Jews in the world today and the largest Jewish society in the world obviously is Israel without understanding this the, the trauma of and I'm tempted to call it a collective near-death experience because the attempt was to eradicate all Jews from the face of the earth but of course it was a death experience it was the Jews of Europe were of continental Europe were basically wiped out there were a few pockets of survival but to six million to die and to be murdered in this way over a period of years, a million children, um, will leave a mark. And it's a mark not just on those who lived through it. I think this is the thing that I, I've realized in recent years. I think there was a, there's been a lot of focus, even among Jews actually, uh, about those who are directly in line, meaning the child, the, the survivors, or the children of survivors, or even now the grandchildren of survivors, as if they 
would have this inherited trauma. I think it's a mistake. I think the trauma has been inherited by all Jews, um, even those who are not directly linked. Within, as you said, within living memory is that degree of suffering and f the fear that that has left has absolutely left its mark. And uh, it means that there is um, two impulses that have been left. And I, I don't think it's just to say one impulse is among one, this, some Jews and the other impulse among other Jews. Both, I think, war within many Jewish minds. And that is two versions of never again. There's one never again, which says, never again must a horror like this happen anywhere. And that's why there are so many Jews who are activists and active now in any movement for human rights and civil rights anywhere in the world. Um, you will always find Jews involved. And that impulse lives very strongly. And then there is another impulse, which is uh, directly related to what happened, which says, never again must this happen to us. We must not be vulnerable again, where we arrive on a train and we are utterly defenseless, not a weapon between us, and so we can be lined up and sent in to gas chambers. Both of those impulses live within the contemporary Jewish soul, and I don't think you can understand Jews, and obviously the biggest Jewish community in the world, Israel, unless you know that. Yes, I was going to ask you whether you think what you've just described is sufficiently borne in mind with respect to uh, contemporary events, i.e. the war that is currently unfolding in <coughs> Israel, Gaza, the West Bank. Well, I think it's, you know, the Holocaust lives on in this current subject, uh, in, the current, in the current war, for a couple of reasons. I mean, the first thing to say is there is no comparison between what we, the events of 80 years ago we're describing and what we're witnessing now, there doesn't need to be a comparison. What's happening now is appalling in its own right and you can judge it in its own terms without reaching back to those events. The, they, I mean, just by way, you know, to explain what I mean, obviously there's the point about scale. You know, when, when Rudy escaped, uh, Auschwitz, the death rate was, the murder rate rather, was 15,000 a day, which means 30,000 in two days, in one camp. And there were five camps equivalent to Auschwitz in terms of death rate. Uh, Auschwitz is the one that is talked about a lot, but there was also Belzhets, Sobibor, Treblinka, Majdanek, and earlier Chelmno. That was the death rate. So the scale is it, we're talking six million people. But the other point is, you know, that uh, uh, about now is obviously what began this current war was an attack on October the 7th, which did touch all these nerves in the Jewish psyche. We're talking about the Hamas attack on Israeli civilians, in which for many, many hours they were completely defenseless. That, and that's a question, by the way for the Israeli authorities of why the army was not there. And grandmothers and children being hidden in basements. And people hiding, uh, exactly. That feeling of powerlessness and defenseless. That, by the way, is very important to understand the trauma now. When we've both been there and both have been reporting from there, what people will say is it, it struck this nerve of a memory, an inherited memory of being defenseless and, and traumatized. So I would say, uh, that, and so therefore, the, the, there was an issue of an attack which had to be responded to. And there was, you know, there is no, uh, there wasn't a Jewish attack on Germans that led to uh, the Holocaust. So, you know, I think, we, 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 I, I think there is no comparison. Why does it live on though? It lives on firstly for the reason we've just said, uh, or, or live loudly now. The, you know, in the Jewish memory, it's there so strongly. And that's why immediately after an experience like October the 7th, there is this uh, instant, impulse to hit back and hit back incredibly hard because we mustn't ever again be vulnerable to attack. It's something I think the rest of the world finds very hard to understand, the intensity of that reaction, but I think it's rooted to this damage to the collective psyche. That's one. But second, I think obviously people want to make the comparison because they know how potent 
it is. And so people reach immediately for that comparison. I think there are plenty of things to compare this current war to, other wars, uh, which, and, and w which are bad enough without having to make this ultimate comparison. I'm going to throw this open to questions in, in, a, in a minute. I'm going to ask one last question, Jonathan, and maybe reply, although it's a complex subject, fairly briefly, so that the audience has a chance to ask. So please prepare any questions if you have them. Uh, well, not only has, has genocide been invoked, but of course uh, South Africa has accused Israel uh, of genocide before the International Court of Justice uh, in The Hague. The Genocide Convention, of course, uh, came into being in 1948 in response to the events we're describing, in response to the Holocaust. And here, uh, two, two generations, three generations on, the descendants of, of those people, the survivors, uh, face uh, these, a charge of genocide in Gaza, where local authorities estimate 25,000 Palestinians have been killed in the retaliatory Israeli bombardment. Uh, Israel uh, is facing this accusation, and the court has found has urged Israel to restri restrain from any act uh, that might constitute genocide under that convention. It did not call for a stop to the Israeli attack, uh, and the actual finding will take years uh, to reach. But I'm wondering what, having just written this book about genocide, what reaction uh, these events provoke in you? Um, well, they've filled me with intense sadness. I mean, the deepest kind of sadness. I've, I don't know of an event I've written about or covered in my 35 years doing this that has made me sadder and angrier than this one. Um, I think it's, um, it's an appalling moment that has been reached and in the, in the in, 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 you know, Jewish history, I think. Um, I think you're right to emphasize that the court has not given its judgment on the substance of the claim yet and that will come in years to come. Um, I think people can and have, I understand why, immediately drawn attention to you know, the hypocrisy of South Africa, which brought the case, which nevertheless decided with Putin when Russia was before the court over its uh, invasion of Ukraine. And in that case, where actually the court did say, which they didn't in this one, you've got to stop, they said to Russia. Uh, the South Africa took the other side and was with Putin, that they uh, 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 have been allies of his. So I think there's hypocrisy there, obviously. And also, you know, the hypocrisy that we live in a world... You were on a stage here yesterday, Roger, with Anjan Sundaram, who talked about seeing reports of the four or five million dead in the Congo, and in Congo, rather, and reported on, you know, in a small item on the inside page of your paper, The New York Times, no genocide case brought before the International Court for that one. Um, 750,000 killed in Syria. Again, no case there brought. So I can point to those hypocrisies. All that said, the reason why there's anger on my part is I think of those people, and I've written this, on the, you know, the extreme wing of this very extreme government in Israel and think of the things they have said even put, you know, be, let alone what Israel has been doing, but just the things they have said, the, some of those statements, the recklessness with which they have spoken about flattening Gaza, destroying Gaza, emptying Gaza of its people, opening the door to this legal action, and given uh, Israel's history and Jews' history, I feel, you know, a, a fury with them. Uh, and I do. And even Judge Barak, the uh, yes. Israeli judge, uh, who who rejected some of the parts of the of the court's finding, did side with with the court in in saying that these statements 
were unacceptable he, he, and must stop. He sided yeah. with them on two things, as I understand it, and they were the two things... And aid to go. Yeah, yeah, they were the two things that, in my own writing, I'd been most vehement in, defend, in, in attacking Israel. One was the denial of humanitarian aid, and the second was these extreme statements. Yeah. And those things, I think, are appalling and unconscionable. Um, and uh, he uh, w you know, expressed the anger and sadness that I would feel, even as, by the way, as a survivor of the Vilna ghetto, a child survivor, he is implacably opposed to comparing what has gone on here with the Holocaust. So you can hold both these positions in your mind at once, and that's what I try to do. It is possible in this world to hold two views in your head and even express them. Despite what social media tries to tell you day in, day out, you can even be persuaded by somebody else's argument. And perhaps what, that's what this whole event is about. Okay, uh, I'm tempted to ask you what, what Rudy Verber would have thought about what I just asked you, but I won't. I'll take, yes sir, with the glasses there, yeah. Thank you for that very interesting exchange of ideas. So uh, Hannah Arendt spoke of the bureaucratic racism and the radical evil of the moment, and you've, I think, amply dem demonstrated uh, the difficulty of bearing witness to such uh, a dissent, as it were, into depravity. Uh, but I wondered if you might wish to reflect a bit more on the question of testimony and the extent to which it is possible to wear witness to this uh, kind of black hole, as it were, which occurred then, uh, uh, especially in the light of what Prim Primo Levi spoke about, uh, the gray zone, victims turning into perpetrators, which in some, some senses you also echoed in this particular uh, last uh, bit. Yeah, thanks. Um, the issue is testimony, uh, and it's fascinating. <coughs> and. Um, Rudy, I mean, Rudy was obsessed by that, the need to testify to what he had seen um, and carried on doing it, actually, the rest of his life. And he was a witness in several court cases um, because he believed that you had to keep telling that story. Um, you mentioned... Gosh. Um, you mentioned the um, grey zone. So I, one thing we should just say as a last piece of his story, because it's important so that people don't come away thinking nothing came out of his act of testimony, of his act of bearing witness. And that is, event, you know, the report I mentioned before did reach Roosevelt and Churchill uh, and the Pope, um, but it also did eventually reach, and I say this not just because it's you and me up here, but it did eventually reach a journalist, and actually a British journalist, uh, Walter Garrett, uh, agency journalist in Zurich, who put it in the newspaper. And once it was in the newspaper, and once it was public in June, late June of 1944, then world leaders felt compelled to act. And then, because they were embarrassed that their public knew, by this act of testimony, what was going on. And therefore, Roosevelt issued a kind of edict, uh, you know, a démarche, really, to the ruler in Hungary, and said, you know, we're about to win this war if you are found guilty of de helping the Nazis deport Jews, we're going to hold you responsible. And the Pope issued a similar plea. And then the ruler in the regent of Hungary then uh, more or less g gave uh, an order that the deportation of Jews, which was going on in his country and had been going on for six or seven weeks, 437,000 Jews had been sent out to their deaths. He put the order that it had to stop. And that was just in time to save the 200,000 Jews of the capital, Budapest, who were about to go to Auschwitz. Incredibly dramatically, a train was on its way to Auschwitz. The order came, the train stopped and turned around and went back to Budapest. It meant 200,000 Jews were saved by this act of testimony, um, which is why I say, by the way, that Rudolf Werber belongs up there with uh, Oskar Schindler or Primo Levi. Or, or, or Anne Frank as these names we associate with uh, the Shoah because it was an extraordinary act of heroism. Uh, the grey zone you refer to is that nevertheless uh, in Hungary um, they, they had been able to deport so many Jews until then, 437,000, partly because of those who did not pass on Rudy's warning. Um, 
and they belong in that kind of grey zone you refer to. I'm going to stop there just because we, we should let other questions yeah, in. But uh, there's, there's more to say about that. A, with a bit. Could you make the question very brief? Abs absolutely. A and, and, so there were those, who, es the, the there were those who escaped and there were those who survived. I particularly refer to part one of Viktor Frankl's 1946 book, Man's Search for Meaning. Um, and my question is, how do you relate your book to Frankl's account of the analysis of Auschwitz? And uh, an additional comment, uh, sir, on uh, your take on inherited memory. Well, thank you. Um, your point about searching for meaning, man's search for meaning, um, it's so pertinent with Werber himself who had no faith, by the way, going into the camp and no faith really coming out, um, would, did not believe in God, could not find any meaning that way. And there were people who did and were able to. He could not. The extraordinary thing about him, though, I discovered later on, uh, I tracked down his first wife and childhood sweetheart, um, amazingly, who I found age 93 living in London. And she and I sat with each other. And she herself, by the way, had had to escape uh, being in hiding from the Nazis. And she and I sat with each other six or seven times outdoors. It was during COVID in 2020. And we were talking about the story of the teenage boy before the man who went into Auschwitz. <clears throat> Until in the very last encounter we had with each other, she said, I've got my young grandson is here uh, because there's something I want to give you. And he went upstairs. She said, it's too heavy for me to carry. He went upstairs and he came down with this red suitcase. And almost ceremonially, the two of them, grandson and grandmother, handed me this suitcase. And she said, those are Rudy's letters. I, I want you to have them. In those letters, an amazing moment. I mean, the moment when I thought, okay, I have to write Every this Every writer's dream. Every writer dreams for that moment. And I went through those letters. Rudy was, was to experience a terrible trauma inside his own family, relating to one of his two children, much later on, many decades later, nearly four decades after he had escaped. And I don't, again, I won't say what it is because I want you to read the book, but the response to that was in his letters, he suddenly starts referring to a higher power, a higher purpose. He suddenly starts talking about God, and he had never done that before. And it, saw, it, it was amazing to me that he was a man who could go through Auschwitz, the greatest evil, in a way, that humanity has ever witnessed and, or seen, and still believe that there was no God and to be, not be in a way that troubled by that but when a personal blow came very very close to him involving one of his own children he was then searching for meaning then I don't know quite what to draw from that but it's, it, 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 it definitely says to me something that the, you know, the, the human response to this event the human trauma of it is still impossible to fully understand even all out these many, many years later. I'm going to disobey orders because one of the lessons of this session is that it's very important sometimes to disobey orders <laughs> and take one more question from the lady there. Um, yes, in white. Uh, is there still a mic out there somewhere? Uh, or not? Uh, okay, can we just send a mic across? Can we send across a mic? Uh, Ira, this side, to the lady in white. And a very brief question, a very brief answer, please. A very brief question, please. Yeah. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, my question is related to journalism and post-truth in this war-ridden era. So I would like to hear your subjective opinion about post-truth and journalism in this. Thank you. Uh, quick answer. Quick, uh, quick answer. It's such a big topic and so relevant. In a way, Rudy Verba and that 32-page report was an act of reporting. It was an act of journalism, in a way. He never saw it that way himself, I don't think. He was a scientist. Um, but I think it was about that. To me, this whole period that we're in now 
has reminded us all of the necessity of reliable, truthful, accurate information and against fake news. Um, it is almost the most important thing we have. It, thank you. It's almost the most important thing we have. And it's a two-way process. This is the, the only thing I'll say on it. It's partly about journalists like those of us who are here being careful, being vigilant, being accurate, being truthful. But it's also on all of you, consumers of news, and we're all consumers of news all the time, which is to be selective about what you read and what you share, what you pass on. You know, are you sure this is coming from a good source? Is this a reliable uh, inst you know, supplier of news? And my test for that, by the way, because people say, well, how can I tell what's reliable and what isn't? My test is, does this outlet, publication, website correct itself? Does it admit when it makes mistakes? You know, Roger and I both work for newspapers that have a corrections column of one kind or other. We never want to be in that column. If it gets it wrong, and we all get it wrong, it corrects it. If you are reading something that does not do that, then I would be careful about passing that on. It's like hygiene, almost. We want a sort of clean water supply. We need a clean and, and reliable information supply. And that is on journalists, but it's also on users of journalism to make sure you're doing it right. Thank you all very much. Thank you, John.